and then you know, the environment was cleaned up. The first time I was hearing about this stuff. Wow. It was totally new to me. I dealt with social impact consulting. Hello everyone, my name is Efwa Ellens Ede with Social Impact Consulting. I'm a development consultant with 20 years of experience working with NGOs, international NGOs and bilateral agencies to work in project support, monitoring and evaluation and civil society strengthening. So now I saw that local NGOs lack the capacity to manage large-scale projects which can in turn impact their various communities because they have the connection based on their backgrounds. So this made me create this channel so that I can add value to you for free once you subscribe to this channel and get notified of upcoming videos. I look forward to hearing from you. Hello everyone, how you doing? Welcome to the Development Sector Series, which is known as Dev Sector Series. Another great episode. Make sure you like and share this broadcast so that we can reach a lot more people. Let me know where you're watching from so that I can thank you personally. Follow and connect with me on all my social media handles for future updates. If you have any questions about the discussion in this program, include it in the comments so that we can engage in an interactive discussion. Because when I'm having conversations and asking questions to my guests, please just, if something is in mind, just type up your questions, you know, so that we can have an interactive discussion. Trust me, this guest is not going to disappoint. Today, we're gonna to be having conversations about navigating the relationship between insecurity and education in Nigeria. This is gonna be an interesting discussion following the conversation that we had about two weeks ago with Dr. Kole Shetima, as we discussed the, um, some of the, the, the um, you know, what goes between insecurity and corruption, kind of some of the common themes. So um, he also touched on education. So if you're interested in that interview, check it out on my LinkedIn article for those of you that are on LinkedIn. My very special guest today is Mr. Olusoji Adini. He's a social entrepreneur, a development practitioner who was formerly a senior official in UNICEF. I met him at Toastmasters and was formally introduced by my uh, mentor on, in Toastmasters, which is Distinguished Toastmaster Ine Enang. And he has been such a cheerleader in my journey in this sector as I carve my niche. You know, he's just been so encouraging. I cannot thank him enough. You know, um, when you have people like that in your life, you don't take it lightly. So I'm just very grateful for this special guest. So right now, you all, I am going to be going over his video bio okay so give me one second adeni is a development monitoring and evaluation professional with trainings in cultural sensitivity and management of human capital at various levels of engagement. He has over 25 years of industry experience in private and public sector, as well as a career spanning over 21 years with the United Nations. He is the founder of Africa Back to Basic Education Initiative and Prime Trainers Africa. He is privileged to have worked in several countries across three continents, managing several complex operations, a full professional of international recognition, adequately trained in the use of the latest technology in project management, public health, country-led monitoring and evaluation and reporting. He was the emergency manager for UNICEF 
and co-lead for the UN humanitarian team for the Northeast at inception. He also led the Nigeria United Nations Development Assistance Framework, Civil Society Engagement at the National Peace Plan. He consults for several organizations in the humanitarian space, including the National Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, the National Emergency Management Agency, the African Union Secretariat, and ECOWAS. He was the former chairman of the United Nations Joint Staff Pensions Fund, a $55 billion investment portfolio at the UN headquarters in New York. He is an advocate of total quality management and service excellence. He is a certified Six Sigma professional with in-depth understanding of human resources issues and the need for efficient and effective operations. Since taking early retirement from the United Nations, he founded and co-founded several non-profit and humanitarian organizations such as Africa Back to Basics, Prime Trainers Africa, the Commonwealth Africa Initiative, Wealthways Nigeria, and the MPM Insight Nigeria, among others. He sits on the board of several organizations and remains committed to human capital development of young people around the world, in Africa in particular. Allow me to introduce to some and present to others, Mr. Olusoji Adeniyi. Hello, hello. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to join us. <laughs> Thank you, Afua. It's really my pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. I can hear you loud and clear. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This is going to be so exciting. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, based on our conversation in the past, you, you've always talked about education and you've always linked it to insecurity. You've linked it to the economy. So I just, uh, in fact, I think I asked you for a quote for a couple of years ago, and you also talked about education, you know, linking that to a lack of infrastructure. It was a humorous quote. So I, I just figured, I said, this would just be an awesome discussion <laughs> talking about <laughs> talking about education and how, uh, uh, you know, how that is even connected to um, insecurity. So thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So I guess we're going to get started. Let's so, based, so based on your extensive experience with UNICEF and based on your bio, that's over 20 years. What are your thoughts um, on education in Nigeria? Thank you very much, Afua. I, I have always said this, that if we get education right and we focus on education and education and education alone as a social service to the people of this country, we would have solved 70% of our problems. An educated mind will be a very good citizen, no doubt about it. An educated mind would understand the concept of humanitarianism. They would go out of their way to be their brother's keeper because they will know that whatever goes around comes around. If you give anyone education, politically, the people are aware and their mindsets are transformed from inception such that they know what good leadership means. They know how to participate in extensive political arrangements from the grassroots. They know also what not to accept from their leader, and they know how to demand accountability. These are steps that education brings to the table. Now, to the individual, education positions you to be able to be at the negotiating table full of confidence. You would be able to negotiate your rights. You would be able to negotiate anything that can transform your life. Your economic power is improved by virtue of your educational awareness. And when I say education, please don't misconceive it 
for just going to the university or going to the tech polytechnic or going to school, four walls of a school generally. I'm talking life education where people can go to school, yes, but not just going to school without allowing school to go through them. And that's probably why we are able today to link insecurity convincingly to the challenges that we're having in education. I'll come to that in subsequent questions, but education is life. And I think mm -hmm. that if we get it right, we will be solving a lot of life's problems. Okay, that is. So, um, like you said in your first question, how do we now, uh, how do we now link in education with insecurity? Thank you very much. Several years ago when I was growing up, uh, my county used to have a school in Meduguri, a private school. In fact, one of the very first private school in Northern Nigeria. And my father would make it compulsory for me so I could understand that Nigeria is so vast. So I'll go by train all the way and then I'll connect to Meduguri, you know, as a teenager. And what I noticed then was that Meduguri was a very buoyant city. It had the Lake Chad Development Commission, it had the Lake Chad Training Institute, it had the University of Maiduguri Staff School, it had all this ambience of educational city. And you would see that at 12 to one o'clock, children are all dressed up in school uniforms and all over the place in the city. So because the these educational institutions also have staff from all over the world. They have international schools within you know, their premises. So their staff attend international school and some of the local staff also have their children attending international school. So generally, everyone around Meduguri at that time wanted their children to look like those children that were going to the international school. And that was what probably brought the idea for my aunt to start her own private school. And then you can imagine what that meant because a lot of people couldn't get to the staff schools of the University of Maiduguri, to the staff schools of the, the Lake Chad Development Commission, to the, to the staff school of the, the Lake Chad Research Institute and all of that. So, so these private schools sprang up as a result of people not being able to get into the best because the ones that were built by the government at that time were of lower standards to these international schools. Now, how does this connect into insecurity? Just one minute. At the same time, across the Northwest and the Northeast, there was a growing influence of Islam on the population. Majority of the Islamic teachers were relying on parents bringing their kids as Almajari children. And funny enough, in the all of my degree, because of this educational revolution, majority of the parents wanted their children to go to the international schools or at least go to the private schools rather than to just go in for Islamic education outrightly. But in places like Kano, in places like Jigawa and the rest of the Jigawa didn't exist at that time, it was part of Kano state. But there was Dutse, there was Damaturu and the rest of them. All this Almagerism concept was thriving. All the the Islamic scholar needs to do is to just start a small space behind the mosque and parents send their children in there. And the children are sent out to go and beg for hams in order to survive, you know, while they are going through their Islamic education. So for a long time, the people in the Northwest, especially the scholars, were making quite a livelihood. They have four wives and they were living very comfortable life from the Almajari children. But in the Northeast, where Meduguri was the capital, the children that were there were going into Western education schools because that was the in thing around them. Then the scholars around there, the Islamic scholars around there say, what's happening to us? The guys in the Northwest are making money. We are not making money because the kids are not coming to the primary, to our own Islamic schools. So they started giving that title, Western education is bad. And that was the origin of saying that it is an aram to go to Western education instead of coming for Islamic education. So the origin, the core origin of, 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 of Boko Haram 
was just because they couldn't meet up with the standards that the international schools and the private schools in Maguguri were producing. And they just wanted to blackmail the people sending their children there and saying, look, it is wrong. And some people, of course, because they were able to manipulate the environment, a lot of the children, I mean, a lot of the parents that didn't go to school started seeing, oh, so if I send my child to, the, to, to Western education, they will end up being corrupt. And because corruption stories were also going around at that time, that was the time that we had the first coming of Muhammad Buhari, the Diagma situation where a lot of, you know, um, civil servants were being uh, brandished with corruption and all of that. So they, they took advantage of that. I said, if you send your children to Western education, this is what they become. They become chiefs. Wow. And then, and then, so, so it, it's bad. Let them go for Islamic education where they will be taught how to be honest and how to, you know, respect the wish of Almighty Allah. And that, of course, we know is the exact opposite of what Western education brings to the table because even in Saudi Arabia, in the Emirates, we see that they embraced both education side by side. So that was the origin of insecurity. And that remains our biggest challenge to today because those who managed to get, they get back into their own camp, they started to teach them to hate Western education and then they grew up completely believing that Western education is wrong, is around, and it is not something to be pushed to be perceived. And of course, by the time they grew, they form a very big gang that the politicians found very attractive because they know that, okay, these ones can vote now and there are quite a large number of people. And so, Mohammed and the rest of his team at that time, Mohammed Yusuf, who started Boko Haram, was able to command a large followership. And the politicians then found him very handy because he has a large followership that could win elections. So they started encouraging him and going to his camp to promise that they would give him opportunities to teach Islamic education and the rest of them. And then, of course, when it became difficult for them to manage him, the, the insurgency came up and then he went out and began to attract, you know, what was, I mean, he took advantage of what was happening in, in, in 2001, the, 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 the whim around the world, you, you know, where Al-Qaeda and the rest of them were looking for foot soldiers. And then they started, you know, connecting and giving them money. And then today, you know, that's how we got connected internationally to terrorism and the rest of them, all in the name of Western education is bad. Okay. I, I just want to kind of, this is so enlightening for me because I just knew that Boko Haram is Western education is sin. And I just didn't realize the inception of it, like how it, it, it the, the origins of it. How was the so, origin? So how did, did that connect with Western education is sin to the destruction that we're experiencing these past, what, 20 years? In, in okay. Nigeria. So, well, how do we come it's, up with those? It's, it's, if you look back, it, it's been 20 years of global insecurity around Al Qaeda, around, you know, all the, the very terrible situation in the Middle East. And then, of course, the Libya situation happened and worsened it because a lot of these people did not even have Western education, they, they only had Islamic education. And for them, for some of them, they didn't even have the true Islamic education. They had the modified Islamic education that were being paraded by their own Islamic masters. Some of them believed so much in life after, you know, the jihad and that they were going to have, you know, maidens in heaven to welcome them if they die in the course of propagation and the rest of them. But the, the bottom line, the bottom line why I still strongly believe that if we had gotten education right, if, imagine if the kind of education that we had in that inception, the kind of education that we have in that inception was what we have in the Northwest. So, so it wouldn't have been only Meduguri that was, you know, uh, seen that we would have been able to convince the rest. I mean, what we are now having today, we are having what we call the Changri Lai, which is the integrated Islamic education where we are we're now having both Western and Islamic education integrated together such that, you know, we're now getting people who can as well recite the Quran and also do numeracy and, and literacy in, in, in Western education. And if we, if we tailor back and we go back to how we got here in the first place, you would realize that up till this moment, 
we're still having a major, major, major challenge in managing even the basic education system. Yes. We introduced free education at basic level up to GSS3, but we didn't have the infrastructure to support it. In some states that have the infrastructure to support it, we don't have the right teacher training that can deliver the results. Education is about catching them young. That's why I started the Back to Basics initiative. Okay. Education is about learning to read from the very early age. When a child learns to read from age three to age five, that child would never drop out of school, no matter the situation, because the child will have understood the fundamentals of reading. What we have currently are the old curricula that the colonial masters left behind. In the Ministry of Education today, a lot of changes have happened, but that's at the Federal Ministry of Education. We're not getting it trickling down to the local level, especially at the state. The states are still embracing you know, what they think is unique to them. With the teachers are not being taught how to teach reading. The teachers are not being taught letter sounds. They cannot teach what they don't know. I just finished a study about early childhood education and the early grade reading assessment. And we're having children score less than 10% in letter, letter identification. And if you don't identify letter sounds as a child, you can never become a reader. If you see a child that is learning in school, how you know is that even on a Saturday, that child carries the bag and wants to go to school. That means school is fun. You know, you struggle with them on a Saturday to say, no, you don't go to school on Saturdays and Sundays. School resumes again on Monday. And they start crying because they are learning. When a child learns to identify letter sounds, that's the child that runs after you, sees your car and sees Corolla and start reading K O R O. Daddy, I know, I know. Ko, oh, ro. Because the child has been taught how to read letter sounds. And that's the basis for learning any language in the world. Once you can identify the sounds of the letters, you can read, you would always want to read. So what we are having now is children are still being taught A, B, C, D, E, which are the names of the okay. alphabet. Which is what teachers that were taught in their teaching, uh, in, in their colleges of education, and they, of course, cannot get the same results that the private schools are getting. That's why everyone abandons those ones. I mean, everyone who can afford it abandons that and goes for the Montessori and goes for the private schools that are teaching letter sounds. And then you position those children side by side. The ones who go to the private schools where letter sounds are the basis of teaching, they do so well compared to the ones that are in public schools where their teachers don't know any better. So the, the insecurity link now is very simple. If you look at what we get from the children who understood and can read from early age, when they become young adults, they can read newspaper articles, they can read social media articles, they can read and understood that when they are talking about Nandi Kanu, it is not somebody that has abused Buari and is being punished for it, like their own masters will tell them in their schools, in the, in the Islamic environment. When they are preaching on Friday, they simply just tell them something. And because they don't have any means of verifying it, because they didn't even learn to read when they were in school. Education, they've dropped out at, at primary five, at primary six. And that's one reason why the Almarjeri schools did not survive in the real instance of it. Because those children were already on the street and they understood this language of the street. They were already making money on the street. They already got, you know, they are all role models on the street. They are all role models are the Kekena pep drivers. They are the bike riders. They are the people who follow the truck all the way to Lagos, you know, which is their own London, all the way from, from Unguru and the rest of the North. They just want to get to Lagos. And when they get to Lagos, even without a word of English, they know that someone will, you know, uh, use them as a security guard, they just need somewhere to sleep. And then, of course, they are so easy to recruit into, you know, the so-called insurgency that we are talking about. So the reason why we are having high level of banditry, high level of kidnapping, is because all these young people are growing. They do not have basic education to read and write and understand what is right from what is wrong. And they do not understand that there is any future for them. They see a bleak future. So when their masters call them and say, you see, Nigeria is bad, corruption is everywhere, 
even if you get a job, how much are they going to pay you? Come, let's work together. If we pick up one person and we get 20 million, I give you 500,000, you can start a business. That's the mindset with which they go into crime because they really don't have anything. They don't have education. They don't have knowledge. They don't have skills that they can sell. And then, you know, these people are throwing offers at them. The politicians are also involved. They know exactly where to get them when they need them because they can use them to scare their opponents for not coming out to vote when it's time to vote. They can use them to, you know, get voters card, you know, and, 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 and vote their, their way through. So these are things that are the, the, the education need to, to, to engage. Majority of these people is the linkage between insecurity and education that I'm saying that the next us is for us to go back to education, get the education sector correct. Let's get the teachers to understand how to teach and get the children to learn to read early. Once all of that are put in place, we will cut off the supply chain into banditry, into, into, into kidnapping, into terrorism. You can only shoot a terrorist with a gun. So gun will kill a terrorist, but education will kill terrorism as a whole. The way, the more of these terrorists that we shoot, we're back, we're getting to Kano um, helicopters and the rest of them now. We are only addressing the symptoms. The root causes is because there is a continuous supply of people that are ready to fight for what they don't even believe in, just because they don't see anything better. So there is a constant supply coming from uneducated youths. So even if you kill the ones that are already in it now, it's only a matter of time before the ones that are in training take over from them. So you must cut the supply. Use education to cut the supply of available youths that are ready to be used by these insurgents, that are ready to be used by the kidnappers, that are ready to be used by the bandits. Once we cut off the supply, educate those youths, give them a skill, that they can sell, they, they see a future. If you now want to enroll them into banditry, they tell you, no, this is my plan for my life. I am a bricklayer, I'm a mason, I'm a, 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 a technician, I'm a painter, I'm a sculpt, uh, you know, I, I have skills that I can sell. So that's what I want to do. So even if I want to go and ozzle in the city as they speak, once I get, you know, 20,000, 30,000 to start my business, I am good to go. And that will begin to reduce the availability of these people for the crimes that we are trying to, to protect. This is, this is just so substantive. Guys, if you have any questions, please put it in the comments so that we can continue this conversation. Um, you know, it, 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 this is really, this is eye opening for me. You know, this is just such, is you just, you know, that how you know when somebody is, understands the technicalities of the root cause of the problem is when they can explain it and a third grader understands it. And this is the way you're explaining it, sir, in terms of the connection between education and um, insecurity. You touched on this on this question, even as you were responding to, to this. So you talked about cutting it from the source in terms of cutting terrorism from the source, educating, uh, the populace. So how do you believe the way the way the situation is now, it seems very cumbersome. How do you feel like the government can address these issues in your perspective? Thank you very much, Afwa. I, I mentioned it in some of my response that the first thing is we need to make sure that there is education infrastructure to support learning. If learning starts taking place in school, then we will be cutting the supply chain for availability of these young people into these criminal gangs. That's number one. Number two, even where the schools already exist, we need to retrain the teachers. There are lots of funding going out of scale around teacher training. But what is happening is not teacher training. It's just gathering up people, speaking to them for two to three days. That's not teacher training. And that's not going to give us the kind of teachers that we need to teach our children. We had an experiment in Kaduna State where the governor had to sack over 20,000 teachers and recruit new teachers. And today, that state is going through so much transformation at the basic education level, but not too many 
governors would dare do that because of political reasons. In fact, it was so threatened. The governor of was threatened by the Nigerian Union of Teachers and the rest of them about and my argument is if we hire new teachers to replace, they will still be members of the Niger Nigerian Union of Teachers. We're better off with you know people who are teachable. We are better off with people who can teach our children so that we can all go to sleep tomorrow. If the children learn, you know, and, and these issues are addressed and the supply chain is cut off from you know availability for 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 banditry availability for for kidnapping availability for terrorism we will all be better we'll all go to sleep much better if we think that we can send our own children to good schools and all of that they are not going to exist in isolation those that we are not sending to school will keep the ones we sent to school awake and they will pick them up at random we just saw an, a very bizarre example of 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 bandits going into our national defense academy to 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 to, to, to kidnap i mean that's unheard of that's the the height of, of everyone so so you you understand what we're talking about so these until we make sure that we don't have supply for these people and how do we make sure we don't have supply by making sure that the ones we have now are converted to good citizens before it is time for them to be engaged by the, the people on the other side. And, and of course, finally, the, the schools themselves must be designed in such a way that the community engage with the school. The community, there's a system called the, 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 the schools management committees, which is a committee that is formed and headed by you know, a, a, a respected member of the community and the head teacher or the the principal is the primary, I mean, is the secretary of that committee. And the, the community and the school, there is a town meet gown kind of arrangement. So they know the children that are not going to school. They know the teachers that are not coming to school regularly. And they provide a kind of feedback to the you know, Ministry of Education at their capital to ensure that learning is actually taking place in their school. So until we hand all of this back, that's what we're doing in, 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 in back basics because we believe that the the education sector cannot be handled by government alone and remember my quote education is too important to be left in the hands of politicians because they are yeah. the primary beneficiaries of illiteracy mm. 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 that is really something so so i just wanted to follow up with with your response now we know what's going on now in the, in the country where we have some of the members of boko haram some of the bandits that are coming out and telling the government that they are sorry and citizens that they are sorry they want forgiveness and then talking about the way things are now like what can we do with the situation where we already have um casualties which are um, citizens that have been harassed by bandits and then you now have bandits that are saying that are turning themselves in like what can be done at the moment i, I don't know I, how I, to I, a bandit, a bandit. Ephra, Ephra, i i i am a student of psychology and i understand mm -hmm. the concept of social transformation if someone believes in a particular ideology for mm -hmm. his adult life and suddenly finds out that the government is making an effort to make it unattractive for him to continue to believe in that ideology. The safe place to be is to pretend to have transformed and say, I sorry, I, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I now believe that you know, we need to change. That doesn't make them changed people and the government should not fall for that. If you have changed really, Let's put you to test. Let's let's gather you the same energy with which you are fighting. We are farmlands that needs to be dealt with. So we're not going to just say, "Hey, we rehabilitate you." No, we bring you in. You are free citizens indeed, but you are going to be under watch for the next five years. You are going to work on the farm, and you will be paid. So it's not like we are you are in prison. So let's put them in those kind of space and use them productively and let the country benefit from their energy. They're still young people that can farm, they can do animal husbandry, they can do all kinds of things that we can feed ourselves as a nation. Those places where they have destroyed, where the farmers can no longer go to the farm and is 
ending up not giving us food. They are still the same people that can work in those areas. So let's set up farms for them there and let them produce food that the real farmers are not able to produce so that the rest of us can be happy with them, that they are truly repentant and that they would serve their nation. So they can serve their nation. The soldiers are serving by defending us. Let them serve us by producing food. That would be my approach rather than just giving them an, an amnesty. Thank you so much because I was because when I, I, I was having when, when I was hearing the news about uh, whether or not the government should yes. give them amnesty or what have you, I, I was I have no problem. It's, so, it's amnesty, it's, but amnesty with the condition they will hand salaries to work in the farm. So, what the food the produce from the farm will definitely pay their salaries. So, that's not a problem. We can have them there and we can use them for those purposes. They have energy, we won't use them in military, we won't use them in security and defense, we will use them for information gathering but they let them work on the farm and produce food because they already sent the farmers away from the farm. That's why we're having very high cost of food items in all parts of the country because the, the, the onion farmers are not on the farm anymore. The, 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 the carrots farmers are not on the farms anymore. They've, they've driven all of them away because of insecurity and, and banditry. The, 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 the people that are producing even animal husbandry, cattle rearers and the rest of them, they've run away from those parts and they're encroaching on other areas where, you know, other food producers are supposed to produce. And this thing cannot really, you know, work, continue like that until we, we take a position. Interesting, sir. Interesting. This is, this is really, and you've, and you've already talked about, because I was going to put, um, in terms of possible solutions, you've already addressed that already in terms of uh, uh, making the, the, sure that, there, there, are always, there are always multiple solutions. There is no single solution to, to, the, to the challenges. The challenges are hydra-headed. The truth is that whether we like it or not, the nation cannot transform from where we are now to where we want to be overnight. There has to be a process. And the process is not just military. You have seen how the U.S., military with all their might failed in afghanistan they left in a hurry and then of course the, the, the we know the story so it's not the military might if we like we get 200 to Kano helicopters we just saw that in zamfara state the jets was brought down by bandits so until we get our system right bottom up where we cut the supply such that young people that are idle are no longer idle, such that they can be recruited. If we talk about farming, how have we made farming attractive to young people? If we still show them people that are sweating on the farm with cutlasses and hoes and, and machetes and the rest of them, then we are not attracting the young people into the farm. If we show them a mechanized farm where all you need to do is learn how to drive the tractor, all you need to do is learn how to drive the harvester, all you need to do is learn how to push the, the, the suckers on the cattle to, to extract milk, everyone will want to be like that. We will all want to wear white jackets or green jackets and go into the farm as young people. But we are not doing that. We are busy picking, sharing, and trying to find grazing grounds for people that do not want to change their method of farming. It's, it's not going to work. All this has to be integrated. I believe that we have young people that can farm and feed this country, and we can be net exporters of food. That's primary responsibility of government to understand that we should keep we should stop talking about our, our youth being lazy. We should focus on how we can take advantage of their energy and discourage them from joining the other side of the gang by making it unattractive to them. But to make it unattractive to them means we have to give them something that is more attractive, something that gives them a future, something that they can wake up in the morning and look forward to doing for the day. The ones that are doing 419 and, and scamming people around the world, they believe that they were legitimately just taking, you know, what is available. But if we put these same people in a tech camp, I can tell you that the same skill with which they were doing that, they will use it to produce, you know, advanced technology for our agricultural transformation. 
Exactly. That these are these are these are these are great solutions. Yes. And you know, if we arrest you know, them, we're arresting them and then putting them in jail. No, that's not the place to put them. We arrest them, yes, and then put them in a space where they can use their skills better. And then they begin to see a reason why God gave them those skills in the first place. Rather than using it to scam people, they will use it to develop systems and proper processes and operational modalities that can transform the country. This is, I feel like uh, if, if I had you and Dr. Coley side by side in terms of the conversations that we had a couple of weeks ago, it's like this, 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 it's, this something, it's something that is possible in the future. I watched that episode myself yeah. and I was excited at you know, some of the solutions that Dr. Coley you know, uh, provided. And I, I, I yeah. very much agree with him on a lot of, of, of his postulations. Mm -hmm. well, my, 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 my position has always been, as a social development worker, mm -hmm. to understand that governments can do good for the sake of doing good, and they can do good well. Forget about the challenges that we have as in, in, in corruption and the rest of it. By the time that people see a good reason to do what is good, trust me, the transformation will begin to happen bottom up. And one of those solutions is in addressing the educational challenges. I went through the whole of the Northwest, and I couldn't see one state that I would say I think in education sufficiently serious enough. They will build very nice schools in the city centers where they are actually competing with the private schools, but go outside the city centers into the suburbs. And then you would see that they have three block buildings, wow. three, three classrooms. And then those three classrooms, they are supposed to be used by students in primary one to three in the morning. And then in the afternoon from 12 noon, students in primary four, five, and six. And this is what happens. After you've been in school from primary one to three, and you're supposed to come back in the afternoon for primary three, four, I mean, primary four, five, and six. The student's mindset is that by the time they spend three years in school, they see it more like an apprenticeship. That, oh, I already went to school. So at primary four, they only come when they feel like. And because they haven't even been taught reading in primary one to three, school becomes <laughs> like stamp to them. They've now gone out onto the street to help their parents on the farm and they make some extra money by selling off a couple of things that are not being used on the farm. So they started making money at this point, going back to school. That's why school dropout for them is very, very high. The schools make it very convenient. Because imagine if they have six blocks of, of, of classrooms and they have you know a teacher office or a head teacher office attached to it and they have toilet facilities in the school. I mean, I took note that more than 30% of the schools with the three blocks don't even have a toilet. The kids can't go to what? toilet while in school. Education back to basics. If I re 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 reveal what we are seeing in some of these states, you will be shocked. In the cities, in the capital, things look good, but go to the suburbs. And if the problem is in the suburbs, because that's where the enemy recruits from. They don't recruit often from the city. They recruit from the suburbs. And if you want to know what's going on in the city, once the suburbs people come to town, they don't want to go back again. They hang on under the bridges and under the coverts and everything, everywhere they can sleep. They sleep in mosques, in churches, anywhere they can, they can find space. And they are so easy to recruit. They, they, they learn to drive Kekena Pep, they learn to drive the bike so easily. If they don't get on the truck to go to Lagos, they get on the truck to go to Abuja. You go into the street of Wusetu in Abuja and you see them saying that they are doing car wash. But God help you if you left anything in your car for them to wash. Mm. They will help you clean it up as well. I picked up one to come and pick all the papers that I wasn't using in the office a couple of weeks back. And he looked around and found the battery of my generator very handy to pack with the papers. And it was when I checked the CCTV that I, we were looking for the battery, we couldn't start the generator. Only to realize that the guy I gave paper to take away to, to make some extra money for himself also took the battery along. So their mindset is they don't owe anybody anything. They probably thought, oh no, this is their opportunity to make some extra money. And that's what mm -hmm. they're doing. Even when you see them in the city and you want to help them, they have a mindset of entitlement that oh, you know hold them anything and they don't hold you also anything so they will make money 
at your expense. They will do anything illegal just for them to make what they think is a living. And that's where we are, where we are, to use the word of, of the vice president. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. This is, and, and it seems um, that that this solution is relatively simple, is just making sure that we revamp the education system. Revamp the education so system, I, we train our teachers, mm -hmm. ensure that skills are earned from school. That was why we introduced the 344 um, the, 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 the three, three, four, four system in the first instance to ensure that people have options after primary school to go to technical colleges and get a skill if they are so inclined. But we've, we've almost all forgot about that now. If you ask the Ministry of Education in any state, how much is being pumped into the technical education? You would see that it's very small fraction. All they do is pay for WAEC. Mm, it's, it's not like, oh yeah, we've done, we've done so well. And then because there's a lot, of, a lot of youth. Exactly. What about kids who don't want to do you know, university. Exactly. And it's not compulsory that every child must go to the university. No, you make it look no. like that is the only thing that, that changed their life. No. When they get exactly. a skill, when they get the right skills, they will become better citizens. And they will not be available to be recruited by, by hoodlums and bandits and, 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 and kidnappers. In fact, they won't be recruited by, 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 by fellow uh, forward niners. It will be difficult because they have a skill, they have something that they want to sell. And then we will we will we will we will have a better nation. Thank you so much for that uh, for that response, guys. This is an interesting discussion. If you have any questions, put that in the comment section. Okay, just put that in the comment section. So, um, uh, Mr. Soji, I have, a, I have a, another another question. So, you we talked about the government and their role to to make sure that we have. Right the right education and creating an enabling environment for them to thrive. Now, what is our, what would be my role as a citizen in creating equity education in Nigeria? What can we do as citizens to make this uh, better? Though, you know, I know in Nigeria we're very individualistic, so maybe we can play a role as well till, I don't know, things get where it needs to be in terms let, of- let, 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 let me say that, we as citizens have roles to play, just like government has a role to play. Yeah. Equity is what we practice naturally in our family settings. But when it comes to national nation building, we run away from equity. If you have four children and one has learning challenges, would you concentrate on the three that don't have learning challenges and leave the one that has learning challenges? Not likely. In fact, most likely you will spend all your energy on that one that doesn't have, I mean, that has learning challenges. That's equity. That's, 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 that's not equality. Equality will mean spending the same amount of time with all four of them because they are your children. But you know that this one has a problem. So you want to spend a little more time with the one that has a problem. And that's what we are not doing as a nation. We know the areas that have problems. But we want to do one cap fits all. We want to play equity. I mean, replace equality with I mean, replace equity with equality. It doesn't work that way. If the challenges are in the north, we need to put the money in the north. If the challenges are in the south south, we need to put the money in the south south. It is when we think like that, even as individuals who are building schools. Yes, we are business people. But if you have a business in Habuja that is handing money, then you go to your village and build a school for free that the profit you are making from Abuja can help the children in the village get the same quality education that their own parents cannot pay for. That's where we can use equity to change the world around education in Nigeria. Lots of schools in Abuja and Lagos declaring huge profits, getting the very best teachers around the world. But check what is happening in, even in the villages of the owners. They are leaving that to government to do. And that's where we're not getting it right. The second thing we've been advocating that citizens should do is that all of us went through some schools at our early stages. Most of these schools are not private schools. They are government schools. At the time we went through it, they were good schools. They had good infrastructure, but those infrastructure have been abandoned over the years. 
is it not nice for us now to go back and give a helping hand? Is it not nice for us to go back and reconstruct some of the classrooms? Is it not nice for us to go back and give life to the children that are there to give them a hope that they don't have to join bandits in the in the in the community? They can become like us. That's the role of that, uh, of, 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 of all student associations, that's the role of old boys, old girls. That's what we should be doing rather than just having parties in the city. I hope you understand that. So our role as it is to create a equitable education in the country is beyond just talking about it. We need to take action. And that's what we do at Africa Back to Basics. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, you've talked, you've talked, I know that you're the founder of Back to Basics and you've really um, had some touch points on, on Back to Basics. Can you, can you give us more information on how we can get involved? Excellent. If you have a whole student association that is working on basic education, it has to be primary, junior, secondary school basic education that's where we are focusing at the moment we are hoping that we'll be able to go to higher education because i saw some hostels from university of nigeria and suka on a viral video and it, it got me mad that institution has one of the most expand expansive old students and, and 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 alumni association in the country i don't know what they they think that oh no it's government that is supposed to do that Governments will never wake up to that responsibility anymore. We need to, to work on it. So they can get in touch with us. We know how to facilitate funding that will match whatever fund they are able to raise in order to make sure that those changes take place. And that's what we commit to doing. And we believe that if we begin to use the, those associations, those old students' associations, those alumni associations, to transform education where we came from, we can get back to the basics. Hmm. Thank you so much for that, sir. Can you please um, provide provide us your final thoughts? You've really talked about the education in, in, in Nigeria, the way it is, the root cause of insecurity in Nigeria from the lack of education um, in, the, in the Northeast, the Northwest, and uh, uh, talking about the Amajiri system and Haram and Boko Haram. I mean, this is something that I even, I, I just knew Boko Haram, Western education is sin. But the mm -hmm. root cause of it, I think this this interview alone is going to have enlightened a lot of us on that. So, Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, Final uh, you know, <laughs> Final talk. Final talk, FY. I know, I know we're still going to do this sometimes again in the future. Of course, of course. But, but, but the, truth, the truth is that whether we like it or not, Nigeria is the only country that we have. I, I saw videos about doctors being recruited by by saudi and i'm wondering when our teachers will be recruited and why are our teachers not being recruited because we have not given them that kind of training that steps them out that would want that other nations will want to have them we set up what we call a teachers registration council but it's comatose in my view and these are things that we need to do if we don't have the right teachers we are not going to have the right learning environment in our schools. And if we don't have the right learning environment in our schools, we're not going to get citizens that will love their nation, that will grow up believing that they can give back to their nation, that will grow up believing that they hold the nation anything. I hold the nation every education that I have had. And I believe that I need to give it back to some other people to benefit as well. And that's why we all need to do the very best that we can. It's what it's, education is not cheap but try illiteracy it's very very expensive thank you yeah it, it's thank you so much the the in terms of when even when my my son was growing up and then i would say a b c he said no ah bah, bah. <laughs> and i'm like what do you it's well, not like that. That. <laughs> yes, that's the difference. but you you just really enlightened me that that's they need friends. to know the associated terms. That's the, how they learn how to read. Sound. That's what helps to read. A B C D does not help to read. It in any language. Wow. In any language, it's not English alone. In Yoruba, in Igbo, in Hausa, 
it is the sound of those letters that transform the words. Those words are decoded, and that's when you have a sentence. Stories are whipped around those sounds. That's it. And a child love that from the beginning. You can't take education out of their life for the forever. Wow. You don't give that to them. They get confused when they get to primary four, primary five, and they think school is boring. Teachers are always shouting on them. And they just drop out. Man, th th this is this is so this it's is so enlightening. It's it's just Thank really you. and there was something you talked about in terms of the suburbs of some of these um um city centers. City schools, that, yes. That, that I think something Dr. Coley said that you want these students to go to schools that even a goat do not want to enter because Absolutely. it's so bad, you know. It's so bad. And, uh, and that's why all of us must help to improve it. This, the, the government is doing whatever they can. I mean, we have the mm -hmm. State University of Basic Education Board, we have the University of uh, UBEC, um, the University of Basic Education Commission, and the rest of them. And they're spending a lot of money on education tax to, to get those things right. But the truth is that there's so much leakages on the system. I was in 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 in, in Quara Education Future Summit. I was a guest speaker there, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back. And the governor sat throughout the session, just listening to stories that we were talking about how to transform education in that state. And the truth is that with the thousands, with the thousands of of of, of schools that are in 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 each of those uh, states, if we must get the transformation effect. Government alone cannot do it. Otherwise, they won't be doing any other thing. And we have insecurity as a challenge for them to deal with. We have the health sector. The, the doctors are now being recruited by the Saudis. And we have so many other challenges. But if we get education right, trust me, we will even get the health system working. Because some of our parents who understood herbal, I mean, herbal health cannot write them down. They cannot transfer it to their children because they don't have education. So if we do basic education, if we do hard health education, if we do technical education, trust me, all these problems, at least 75% of them will be solved. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for your time. This was, you know, I, I kept saying it when I was, uh, when I was pushing out this uh, uh, episode that this is going to be a fun and exciting one and you did not disappoint. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much for, for, um, for your time and for enlightening us. It's like, I feel like I have this light bulb at the, uh, on, on my head, really <laughs> learning, learning so much from you concerning the root cause. It's, 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 and, and, and hopefully we as citizens can, can make something happen. Again, um, again, I'm going to say Toastmaster Soji. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so yes, much. I am a Thank, you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you so much for your time. Thank and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see you another time. This is not going to be your last. Um, your <laughs> last uh, I know. <laughs> I look forward to having another conversation <laughs> with you in the near future. Thank you for Thank having you me. So and Thank you so to the rest much. of the world, thank you for listening to us. Please keep thank listening to Afwa. She is who I call the queen of the hairways when it comes to social development. You can never go wrong listening to her. She has all it takes to make the difference. And I've always encouraged that to keep talking. She needs to keep talking to professionals like you. She needs to keep finding the right people to come to this platform to help transform the world. Together, we can make the difference. Thank you, FY. Thank you, Thank you so all much. We need to strengthen you. All the best. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. We got a lot of great, great information from Mr. Olusoji Adeniyi. This was just awesome. We were able to really navigate the relationship between insecurity and education on today. So that was extremely exciting. So just want to give you a quick announcement. I transcribe live at um, the episodes of our live broadcast, and I'm definitely going to transcribe this one. So please um, show love by reading these articles. I have I've transcribed two already. Um, the, the one with uh, Mr. Um, Olusheyi Oyebisi of the Nigerian Network of NGOs and Dr. Kole Shetima 
um, the director of the MacArthur Foundation. So check them out. My website will soon be ready. We're just getting some kinks and uh, situated, and we're going to be uploading um, our very first um, online course, which is NGO Fundraising for Social Impact. If you are interested in the beta launch, send me a message. Um, if you're on YouTube, just put your contact information in the comment section. If you're on LinkedIn and Facebook, send me a message. On Facebook, I have my associated WhatsApp number. So if you want to get um, information about that, you can definitely let me know. Our next guest is going to be um, Dr. Um, Udwa Akban. Okay, she is the executive director of the Youth Alive Foundation. We are going to be talking about gender-based violence, and we're also going to be talking about her role as a youth advocate in Nigeria. You do not want to miss this. Again, the Social uh, Impact Masterclass e-learning beta launch is going to be on in a couple of weeks. I know I've been saying a couple of weeks, now being a couple of months, but look, I'd rather launch out with a bang than launching out and you people are looking at me like, okay, what is going on? So if you want to participate, send me a message. So you know what I'm gonna do right now? I am just gonna put my WhatsApp number right here so that you guys can uh, contact me about the Social Impact Masterclass beta launch, okay? So I'm going to put my number here so you can even send me a WhatsApp number right away if you um, have any uh, questions. So like I said, um, you know, thank you again for watching um, our interview with Mr. Olusoji Adeniyi. He gave us some real, real nuggets about, uh, about uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the connection between education and insecurity, and he did not disappoint. Again, thank you so much for watching, and let us change the world together. Take care.